So before we get to that stage of, uh, of discussion in between us, uh, I would like to introduce the, the members of our panel today. So uh, the, the first member is Vasiliki. Vasiliki, I'm going to say your, your name, but maybe I will not pronounce it the right way. It's um, it's Shadzi Petru. Is it? Sounds about right. It's Hatsi <laughs> Petru. <laughs> Thank you. It's Hatsi Petru, but uh, it's always it's always okay. Vasiliki is both a researcher and a consultant uh, in innovation that can bring uh, new social ways of, of living together, uh, new opportunities, and she will talk to us about the research she's doing and, and how she can implement that in a broader context than opera. But it will be very interesting for us to listen to what we can learn out of those experiences. Uh, the next member of the panel is Patrick Dillon. Uh, Patrick Dillon, uh, we, we know his work in, in Opera Europa from the, the Theatre of Green Book, which has already had two uh, volumes, and Patrick, you are working on the third volume that will soon, soon, be, uh, soon be available. And Patrick will talk to us about that, um, may I say, that series of guidelines and of very practical help that we can uh, implement, try to implement in our theatres and, and uh, Patrick will talk to us about uh, wh whatever, at the same time, opportunities and difficulties that, that it is to, to get to it, what, what are the, the things that restrain us as theatre uh, members and, and leaders to, to really get into an eco-responsibility uh, policy. And then the, the third member of our, our panel uh, is Thierry Leonardi. Thierry uh, uh, has worked closely with opera houses for, for a, a number of years, and he now has a, a, a lot of projects going on, but he will talk especially about the project OSCAR, which is a, a project of mutualization uh, between different houses, uh, with uh, at the same time successes and failures and he will try to explain how this project can help us to see what is really relevant and what can be implemented in opera houses. So let me first give the, the, the word to Vasiliki who I think has a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, thank you Tama. Uh, I need to work Ask permission to, to write or to mind if I stand. Go ahead. It's, a, it's my only opportunity to stand on an opera stage. So <laughs> take advantage of it. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for the invitation. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here and uh, to be part of this uh, panel of distinguished experts in the field. Uh, my name is Vasiliki. I'm going to use a PowerPoint. Uh, sorry for that. It's a usual practice, but this will help me to put things um, in the right order. Um, as I said, it is my first and maybe, I don't know, my last opportunity to be on an opera stage uh, as I'm not coming from an opera house. Um, I am a consultant and uh, with a researcher background. Uh, I feel the need to introduce myself. Uh, because judging from the participant list, I'm maybe one of the very few people not coming from an opera house. So, yes, and I'm going to talk to you mainly um, about an initiative um, with the name of Eco Perform Project. Uh, this project was a project we put together in response, responding to a call by the European Commission which aims at enhancing sustainability in the performing arts. Uh, Europa, Opera Europa is a part of this initiative um, and uh, an enthusiastic supporter, uh, may I say, and that's the main reason I'm here. However, I'm going to talk about the eco perform project within a broader context, encompassing things that were heard uh, these past two days. Um, so, Thanks uh, for, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> Thanks for helping me with the PowerPoint. Thank you. I'm trying to speak the language of the room, uh, so uh, excuse me for any mistakes. The Anthropocene. The images are from production 
commissioned by the Scottish Opera in 2019. Uh, it's um, the sources of our vision in Scottish Opera, and uh, the opera is set in a world uh, which is uh, largely impacted by the climate change in the Arctic Circle. Uh, and it's an opera about how relationships scramble uh, and uh, the heroes have to find alternative ways of being in a dystopic reality. Um, I chose it to initiate the issue at hand, which is the Anthropocene. The term is used to describe the epoch, the era we are currently living in. It's, an, it's not an official term, uh, as opposed to the Holocene, which is the uh, era officially referred to, but it is used to describe the period in which uh, the Earth has and its processes are largely impacted by humankind itself. If we could please move to the next slide. Away from opera, this is what describes it more or less in another picture uh, of how, how we burden uh, our system and our environment and the planet. Um, this is what the Anthropocene uh, looks like. If we could please move to the next slide. The Anthropocene and, and the climate change is just one the challenges that the sector is um, facing right now. Um, you have, we have had discussions about the rest. Uh, this is just a selection of the, of, the, of the big headlines. So digital transformation follows, especially after the pandemic, because it was a way to communicate, to create, to produce, to move on. The impact of the pandemic itself, funding uh, restrictions funding, funding uh, scarcity that always was an issue before the pandemic, diversity, equity and inclusion which was always uh, an issue as well but right now has, is heard more because of what happened to us or this is what I understand and what I perceive and I understand a lot of people in this uh, opera house where right now as well. Um, the eco Reform project that I'm going to speak about addresses the first, uh, the first three primarily. Uh, however, there are efforts and considerations uh, and horizontal aspects in the project that they refer to the last two. Um, if we could please move to the next slide. Okay. Uh, it is about the environment, it is about responsibility, it is the Anthropocene, but how has the sector of the performing arts and the cultural and creative industries in general been impacted by COVID? This depicts something that you have lived through, the people in this room. It's in numbers, uh, it's the technocratic approach, it's one of the recent uh, publications and resources published in early 2021, and it shows the power of the cultural and creative sectors in Europe before the pandemic. And the power is as massive as an annual turnover of 643 billion that actually contributes 4.4% to the EU GDP. I know these are not, um, there are things you've heard before, but this is massive if you consider that it's more than the pharmaceutical industry or the technology industry or the automotive industry. Uh, if we could please move to the next slide. This is what happened because of COVID. We had a drop of more than 30 percent. 200 billion approximately were lost. And if we look at the face of the fall, next slide please, this 90% drop in the performing arts is just scary. This is what you've lived through in the opera world as well. Why do we talk about the impact of COVID in relation with eco responsibility? Because after the pandemic or during the pandemic, things happen such as the opera houses, the theatres, the live performances were not there. 
But the art was there, culture was there, the people were there, and you provided resilience to people. And as I speak in that sense, as one of them, culture supported Europe through the pandemic, speaking about mental health as well. And now it's the turn of Europe to support culture. And this takes place within the sustainability discussion because we need an overarching, a holistic recovery plan to move on. A holistic recovery plan to be sustainable ecologically, financially, in our everyday working life with work-life balance. Um, sustainability is not a monolithic um, concept. If we could please move to the next one. This is written on paper. This is presented in declaration by policymakers, and it's important. Policy is important. There is a framework. This is just a selection of the of uh, an indicated list of papers and declarations and uh, documents in support, encouraging, urging um, uh, for the change. Of course, the you know, UN, uh, United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the well-known 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and it is recognized that culture is transversal, is horizontal in achieving all 17 of them. The European Green Deal, which is very ambitious in aiming to make Europe the first uh, neutral, uh, environmentally neutral continent by 2050, and within it there is also the European New Bauhaus movement, which adds a creative and cultural dimension to the Green Deal, uh, and other, uh, other sub-plans like the EU Recovery Plan after the pandemic, which also has a very strong component referring to culture. The European Skills Agenda, also in 2020, which comes up taking into consideration the green and digital transitions that are happening right now, and with the view to the recovery required after the COVID pandemic, it comes and says that people in all sectors, including the performing arts, need skills to be able to handle, to be able to manage, to be able to move forward in a sustainable way. Uh, and of course, UNESCO identifies the importance of uh, arts and culture in achieving sustainability. If we could please move to the next one. There are responses of responsibility, because it is responsibility, we're talking about equal responsibility, and responsibility comes with power, it's a mutual relationship. There are responses of responsibility, some of them present in this panel, such as the Green Book, or the Oscar project of Opera Nacional de Lyon, um, the uh, Next States Initiative, uh, launched by uh, Fedora and Opera Europa, uh, Julius Bicycle, this is just a selection, I'm sure you're aware of many more, and the experts in this panel can speak of more uh, approaches. And complementary to those, if we could please move to the next slide, complementary to those comes the Equal Perform project, where, <laughs> where I actually come in. Uh, the Equal Perform project aims at enhancing the green digital entrepreneurial, because entrepreneurial skills are a mindset. Being entrepreneurial and creative is a mindset. And in the places where creation comes first, entrepreneurial thinking already exists, I have to say. So it has to do with enhancing these skills of prospective and existing um, professionals in the performing arts sector. Uh, if we could please move on. The partnership, because there is a transnational partnership formed and submitted, uh, which submitted this proposal to the European Commission for Funding, it comprises of 16 partners from seven EU program countries, out of which four are higher education institutions and vocational education and training institutions, 
and 12 uh, are what we call, uh, or what the Commission calls, labor market actors, representatives uh, of the profession. If we could please go to the next slide. This is an overview of the project processes. It might you know, seem frightening and complex. It does. Okay, I get that. <laughs> Okay, uh, it, it, the project starts by identifying best practices, some of which uh, are the ones uh, to be presented in this panel, and its analysis uh, in the subject area, meaning green and digital skills in the performing arts sector, and then on the basis of the, uh, of the needs identified, a curriculum, a training program, will be designed and delivered, and this training program will also entail a strong work-based learning component. Um, additionally, the project has uh, a policy recommendations component, a policy recommendations aspect in the field. It aims to act as a policy ambassador in the fields of education and training with reference to green, digital and agile management skills in the performing arts sector, including opera. If we could go to the next slide, and I'm getting it, I'm getting closed. The target groups, where will these project results be addressed? Who are the target groups? Who can attend the project activities and benefit from its deliverables? I think you may be able to identify yourselves in one of these lines. The project deliverables and especially the training program will be addressed to performance production managers, set scenic designers, state directors, artistic directors, facilities managers, sustainable development managers, trainers and educators in different um, levels of education, and of course it will, the results will be diffused and disseminated through the networks of the partners to academia, uh, vet networks, uh, SMEs, um, opera houses, theaters uh, and other uh, institutions of the cultural and creative sectors. Uh, the next one, please. These are some of the words that were heard during the past two days and um, to my mind are part of what we call sustainability. It's not only about uh, environment and it's not only about um, changing how we use our resources with reference to the environment. Leadership, diversity, inclusion, relevance to the society, how you are relevant, what bridges you have to make or open up again. Resilience, a word that We've used a lot the past few years, and how resilient are we? Because you need to be resilient to be sustainable. It's a different aspect of the same coin. All these things, so how, so the concern about how you handle your own responsibility to change your methods, to be more sustainable, but also so the power of the sector to convey the message, to carry the message to the audiences, to raise awareness about what is happening and how we can achieve a behavioral change. As I said, responsibility comes with power and power comes with responsibility. And it actually comes down to the title of this presentation, which is the challenge of metamorphosis, to transform yourself, the challenge to reinvent ourselves, and where we stand. If we could please go to the last one. Okay, what you see now, the previous one please. Thank you. Speaking of metamorphosis, what you see is different representations of the great myth of Daphne and Apollo. Um, this is by the sculptor by Bernini. Uh, this is the painting by Waterhouse. The, the Greek myth of Daphne and Apollo has informed, has inspired the operatic world more than once. Um, three cases I can recall. Um, Le Daphne di Marco da Cagliano, which is an early Italian monarch opera. Um, then uh, Handel's Cantata. 
and uh, eventually Strauss is um, Daphne. Daphne. And the Greek myth is about how uh, Daphne trying to um, escape Apollo's uh, grasp. Um, she eventually, at the end, uh, transforms Apollo is in love with her because um, Cupid Eris has them um, his tricks, as usual, the eternal story. Anyway, Daphne is trying to get away from Apollo and uh, because of her love uh, for nature, he starts his opera in the end, or when she enters the scene, she sings a hymn, a praise to nature, and eventually she transforms at the end into a laurel tree. I choose to finish that way, obviously because of the metaphor of getting back to green, with reference to equal responsibility, but also because at the end of the day, metamorphosis, Daphne and Apollo appears in all its metamorphosis in the first book, metamorphosis, change, transformation, is the elixir of life, is the key to eternity is the key to continuing existence, the ability to change, transform, and renew with responsibility. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very, very much for this presentation. That uh, not only is inspiring, but also it reminds us that we are part of a much broader uh, issue than what the everyday policy in our theatres confronts us with. And it's very important always to be reminded that all together we represent a strength, an economic power, uh, an economic reality that is very encouraging because the little efforts that we can make in our own theatres at what we might sometimes consider as a very tiny level, in fact, they can be integrated in a much broader system in the, in the concrete cultural world and then will we really have an impact. And so it's very, it's very encouraging and thank you very much. Uh, okay. For the little everyday effort, the, the thing that we can do and that, that can really change the, the, the way we operate our theatres, I will turn to, to Patrick with the Theatre Green Book and Patrick you're going to talk to us about things that work or don't work, but how we can implement practical things in our theatres. Thank, thanks very much indeed. Um, just over a year ago, a few of us in the UK started having some conversations. We were trying to answer a question. The conversations were on Zoom. Two weeks earlier, none of us had even heard of Zoom. Um, but then two weeks before that, none of us had heard of COVID either. And maybe that shows how quickly we're able to change when a crisis is right under our noses. How quickly we're able to start doing things differently when we have no choice. Here's the question we were trying to answer. It wasn't, is there a climate emergency? Or should we do anything about the climate emergency? I'm prepared to bet that everyone in this room knows the answers to those. Yes, we are facing an emergency. Yes, we need to act now. It was a question that came out of some groups of theatre and opera makers that I brought together the winter before to prepare for ITAC, the International Theatre Conference that I chair. How come, when we know there's an emergency, and we know what emergency means, and we know we need to act now, how come of us, how come none of us has really changed what we do? Someone back then said, it's as if we're all waiting for something to be invented. Now I knew from talking with sustainability experts that we're not waiting for anything to be invented. We know, we've known for years what we need to do. We need to use less material. We need to reuse and recycle more. We need to travel more sustainably and use less energy. It made me wonder if perhaps there was another reason why we kept putting this off. Perhaps 
It was about delaying the moment at which we start to change. In the last few months, I have had numerous conversations with people in the arts who say, of course we care about climate and the planet. Of course we'll change. But first, we need to gather data. First, we need to define a methodology. We need data so we know where we are and we can track progress. And I think perhaps this is another way of delaying change, because actually we know where we are and there are easy ways of tracking progress. So what is it we're scared of? I think it's helpful to look that straight in the face. I think we're scared of changing how we work. Can we change? And above all, can we still make work as good? Because that's the thing that unites everyone in this room, making the best work we can. And that's what none of us wants to compromise. When we, when we started talking on those Zoom calls a year ago, a year bit ago, uh, we stumbled on some genuine issues as well, questions that needed answers quickly. Where do I start? What do I do? Is this about audience travel, about scenery, about lighting? Is it about the fires or about the stage, about cooling in the auditorium, about tall lorries, what? Of course it's about all of them. So we divided the challenge into three and they've become the three volumes of the Theatre Green Book. Sustainable Productions tells us how to make productions more sustainably. Sustainable Buildings tells us how to take opera houses theatres towards zero carbon. And Sustainable Operations covers everything else, catering, bars, production and workshops, offices, travel. Another question, there's so much advice, some people said, I Google Google Sustainable Theatre and I don't know where to start. Judy's Bicycle, Broadway Green Alliance, Eco Stage. So we set about studying all that guidance so we could bring it together in one place. The Theatre Green Book was never about competing with others or reinventing the wheel. We wanted to make a single place which told people all they needed to know. We started with sustainable productions because for once all of you who make opera and theatre and dance were at home, locked inside, ready to think and talk, ready to answer questions. Covid has been a tragedy for the arts in so many ways, but this is the silver lining. It's given us time to answer questions, to answer them so that in reopening, not in two years' time, not in three years' time, but now, we can start working differently. Some people said, I get sustainability, but when I'm working on a production, I just don't have time. Time to figure out what to do, to read all that online guidance and then work out what it means. So, we knew the Theatre Green Book had to make this really easy for busy production managers and designers and producers, for overstretched workshop staff and technicians. This is what you need to do now. And then there was the comment that really, I think, led to a breakthrough. One designer said, I'm passionate about this. I've been desperate for years to make change. But it isn't just up to me. I can design a more sustainable set, but what if the director isn't on board? What if the producer allows no time to source materials more sustainably? What if the set builder goes on buying plywood from virgin forests in Brazil? And that was when we realised the really big thing that needed to happen. Sustainable opera and theatre isn't about personal commitment or passion. There's no shortage of and it isn't about theory, that's straightforward. It isn't about data. You can gather all the data in the world, and I can tell you honestly, because I've seen it, that none of us quite understands it. I can't tell you, in carbon terms, what makes a good or a bad show. And no one has learned yet how to match, how to match different productions at different scales and different theatres. The data is only going to tell us what we already know, that this is about using less material, it's about reusing and recycling more, it's about travelling more sustainably and using less energy. We've known that for years. So sustainability is about changing a system which has also developed over years. Everyone in this room knows 
how complex that system is, how many people are involved in making a piece of work. Producers, directors, designers of all kinds, production managers, tour managers, set builders, costume and wardrobe technicians. It's not just that each one of them needs to do something differently, but they need everyone else to work differently too if we're going to unlock the change that lets opera survive in a world facing the peril of climate crisis. And all of those opera makers will move from opera house to opera house. Opera houses will co-produce and tour. So this is what we needed, we realised. We needed one set of standards that everyone can share. And those standards need to tell everyone what to do differently. Whether you're a wardrobe director or a lighting technician, a producer or the director of a new ring cycle. The focus here is not tons of carbon, it's people. Opera makers and what you do and how you can do it differently if you want to make sustainable work. We knew, by the way, that there was no point in writing guidance for some idealistic future. This isn't about zero carbon overnight today, the touring stops, all casts, no sets. It's about a journey where we can all learn together how to make work in the new situation which everyone on the planet faces. So Sustainable Productions has three standards. An advanced show is zero carbon, and yes, I do believe it's possible with practice, skill, and time to make complex, large shows sustainably. But there's also a baseline standard which anyone can start with now. It isn't easy, it does involve change, but it's not so far out of reach that you should hesitate. And it doesn't matter if you fail. No one is judging anyone. The important thing is to start this wheel turning together. How did we go about making the guidance? We knew people had to trust it. And we knew it had to be meaningful. We had to focus energy where it mattered, not on recycled coffee cups, but on real, meaningful change. So we got the best sustainability engineers in the world, we think, Bureau Hapold, to underpin the whole initiative. And we brought together focus groups of all kinds, producers, designers, technicians, producers, and from them we started to learn. What is it you do? What could you do differently? What do you need others to change so that you can make change too? From the very start, opera has been at the heart of this. When we asked for help funding the Theatre Green Book, it was opera companies who came forward among the first. And opera makers gave their time and expertise for free in tackling this challenge together. We put out the Theatre Green Book's first volume, Sustainable Productions, in January, just in draft, free on the website. And the response was overwhelming. Theatre and opera makers started emailing and calling with suggestions, proposals, worries, ideas. We put out the trialling version in the spring, which all of you can download for free after this session. Uh, you just have to go to our website, www.theatregreenbook.com, and you can download it. And for anyone in this room who thinks that sustainability is an initiative for 2023 or 2028, I can tell you that today, as we sit here, every single show the UK's National Theatre makes is made to Theatre Green Book standards. That's perhaps the biggest theatre in the world for productions, and every show they make is meaningfully sustainable. Every show the National Theatre of Scotland makes, every show the National Theatre of Wales makes, is made to Theatre Green Book standards. All the major UK opera companies, nearly all the major UK opera companies, are planning their first trial shows, and we have 60 or more productions around the UK in trial. All those shows are already sustainable. They're not waiting for a policy, they're not waiting for research, they're not waiting for a methodology, they are sustainable today. It isn't rocket science. We do have the tools, we can start now. The second volume of the Theatre Green Book, Sustainable Buildings, is up on our website now. Everyone can start using that now. Two, the whole initiative is free. We're testing a tool 
which will be ready in a few weeks, which will let every theatre and opera house owner develop a sustainability plan for themselves, which tells them what to do to their building in what order. Sustainable operations, the third volume, will be out by the end of the year. But I want to go back to that challenge, that fear that we identified at the start. Can we change? Can we make work that's as good as it was before? One of our sustainability engineers at one point in this process said, I wouldn't want to have to change any other industry, but the arts are different. The climate crisis is changing everything we do, how we live, how we travel, how we eat. It will change art too. It will change opera and theatre too. And I find that exciting. At times during this process, people have spoken of sustainability as a restriction. I don't think it is. To have a wider sense of how our decisions connect us with the earth seems to be not a restriction, but an enlargement of our vision. If that means change, change is culture's lifeblood. If it requires creativity, dynamism, the will to reinvent and find new forms, those are exactly the qualities that make opera and theatre special. And that's one of the reasons that I have no doubt, none at all, that this journey, one which began many years ago for some of you, is happening. The arts can lead the way towards sustainability. There is no going back on sustainability. The earth will not heal itself. The arts will not return to a place where our use of energy and our consumption of resource has no consequences and imposes no responsibilities. And the reason I'm so sure is that in working on the Theatre Green Book, there's one question I was waiting for, but which nobody ever asked. In all our hundreds of hours of conversations, no one, in opera or theatre, ever said, why are we doing this? They could have done. Theatre and opera aren't large sectors all responsible for much carbon. They could have ducked this challenge. And they didn't. And I know why. It's not just our personal conviction, it's the knowledge that if opera and theatre are to have a part in this conversation, perhaps the most critical humanity has ever faced, and I can't imagine a world in which they aren't part of that conversation, then they must themselves become sustainable, to be relevant, to be able to survive in a world under the extreme threat of climate catastrophe. Moving towards sustainability is not a choice, it is an existential necessity, and we all know that. This is happening. No one needs to preach about it. We all know how severe this crisis is. Our only question is what we choose to do. The Theatre Green Book is not my answer, or the answer only of some experts. It's theatre and opera makers' answer, your answer, generated collectively through hundreds of conversations, hours of workshops, through generosity and expertise, through collaboration, and sharing. Is this an easy road? No, funding will be hard to make our buildings fit for purpose. For everybody, changing habits, including creative habits, will be testing. We're all on our journey, and so are audiences. But we know that this is possible. We know what sustainable opera means, and we know how to do it. We know theatre and opera makers are doing it right now. Whatever happens elsewhere, whatever happens in other sectors, with the Theatre Green Book, we've given ourselves the tools we need to paraphrase Graham Holland Brooklyn's definition of sustainability. To make art in the present without compromising the dreams of future artists. Thanks very much. I think that
one of the key things that you, you, you tell us and that comes from all the conversations you have had is that we should not wait to have all the answers to begin doing things because actually we'll get the answers by doing and it's, uh, it's in a way learning by doing which is uh, so important to, to be convinced that this is the way we will find uh, the, the, the answers and not to uh, refrain from trying and from uh, testing things even if they don't work because even when they don't work we still learn things for the next thing so uh, let's always uh, remember uh, what Samuel Beckett said F fail, fail again, fail better and at some point maybe we will succeed so, uh, I'm, I'm turning to, to Thierry, who is going actually to, to tell us about that learning by doing experience with the, the OSCAR project. So, Thierry, tell us about the OSCAR project, please. Yeah, thank, thank you, Thomas. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, Thomas, I, I heard what in your introduction that you, 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 made, you, you mentioned the possible failures of the project. So, I, I will try not to disappoint you. Um, so the, 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 this project called OSCA um, is one of the programs that the, the, the Lyon Opera has developed uh, with its environmental policy, which was itself uh, developed within its more, generally speaking, sustainability policy. And um, the very first idea of, uh, of OSCA dates back to end of 2016. When we think of sustainability issues and how the sector has addressed these issues over the five last years, um, five years ago really sounds like eight years ago, actually. Uh, at, at the time, in opera houses, um, the people who were the most uh, aware and engaged about sustainability were technicians, and especially um, uh, workshops, sales workshops in opera houses. And as we in Lyon uh, were fo focusing most of our system, uh, environmental efforts in the production processes, and because the, the, the biggest awareness and, and effort was coming from, uh, from the workshops and from technicians, we thought we should work on this. And after trying a few things, uh, we came to the idea that if we wanted to make some significant progress, uh, we needed to allow time and resource to research works. And this we could not do um, by, by ourselves. We, to, uh, to implement research, we, we thought that we would uh, we were needed to gather other people with us. We, we thought we should do it collectively. And so that, that's how we, we first thought of a, of a research progress, pro a program, sorry, project on sustainability applied to sex. So I was, I was saying that the very first idea is that back to five years ago and it took us two, uh, two years to gather a, uh, a consortium, to gather partners, to design a project and to apply to the, the, to the creative program of uh, the, the European Commission. This means that we, we applied to creative Europe program in the end of 2018, it was up. We were selected in June 2019 and we started to, uh, uh, the, at the end of 2019 and the project is ending at the end of this year. Uh, and now uh, Thomas is your moment, so be, be attentive. So, um, I, I would say now that we're coming to the end that uh, the, the, the whole design of the project um, lies on the point on a mistake that we did at the beginning and that I did personally for the reasons that I've explained to you. I mean that we really took the perspective, the standpoint of, uh, of a co-design of materials, of uh, scenarios, of manufacturing sets. In other words, we, the first objective of the project was to bring um, uh, environmental knowledge based on science to the sets of workshops. Uh, in, in order to really uh, help them make better informed decisions while they decide which kind of materials they use and how they build the sets to, uh, to, improve, to, to really improve the impact, the environmental impact over their the life cycle. This means 
say more, more simply that the basis, the basis of Oscar was much technical focus. Then I started to, uh, to call people to try to, uh, to, to, to talk with the experts also. And a few conversations, after a few conversations, I understood that this was a wrong point of view and that circularity was also more about co cooperation, about stakeholders, and that uh, we really needed to, to enlarge the scope of the reflection. And I owe this to Danico Kochi, who is uh, in the auditorium this afternoon with us, and who is a partner of the, of the project, who really uh, explained me that uh, really we, we, we should change our standpoints. So, so we, we really um, try to, to, to include this new perspective. And after two years, um, we started so with a group of seven organizations. So, the Lyon Opera, obviously, Gothenburg Opera, Tunis Opera, and a few expert organizations. Um, the UNESCO Chair for Life Cycle Assessment and Climate Change, which is based in Barcelona, the Cité du Design in Saint Etienne, the CIRID, so the organization of the CIRID means this is a center, it's an international center uh, for um, a resource center and a innovation center and sustainable development and the main topic is about circular economy and we had also with us a, a, a research center on materials based in, uh, in Berlin and uh, so with, with this group which was really uh, very mixed and, uh, and basically uh, none of us knew the others before we started to work um, we, we thought we should divide the project in two phases. So we had to, we, we, we thought and this is how we, we should all start when we when we start something that we knew where we were starting from. And so we have organized uh, a research survey about the the, 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 the current practices in eco design along the the, the European offers. And um, so the, the, the ambition was really to to provide a state-of-the-art review to the sector. And that's where we have failed, actually. Um, because we got too, too few answers. So this was very interesting. And, and thanks to a few people, uh, probably the most engaged ones, we, we, we collected interesting information. So um, data is also very important, as, as you know. <laughs> uh, and so that our colleagues on the, the UNESCO chair you know, pro uh, produced two reports, in interesting reports, which, which will be publicly released. But we, 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 cannot, we, we could not provide this state of the art review that we wanted to provide to the sector. And uh, what seems interesting to me is that the second phase, which, is, uh, which was more obscure uh, for, us, for us people from the opera industry, uh, is the one that has really probably produced the, the, the best, the, the most interesting results in the end. Uh, after, after trying to know where we were starting from, in terms of uh, practices in eco-design, once again, circular economy is much wider than eco-design, um, we said, let's try to figure out how we could change this, how we could change habits, the way we work, etc., etc. And um, to do this, we have uh, we have said we, we will try to experiment uh, design thinking methodology and we, the, the, the goal was also to, to give the opportunity to technical people, technical department, production departments experiment this methodology to see if it could be of any help for the sector to, to really uh, imagine new solutions and maybe make kind of roadmap towards sustainability. And I don't know if some of you will attend the workshop that we are giving tomorrow tomorrow morning, um, we will more precisely talk, talk about this process and, and uh, the results of this process and the feedbacks of people who have uh, contributed to, to it. Uh, but in the, in the end, it's, uh, what I like about it is that we, we, have, not, we have not come up with a new, new idea. Uh, because after talking a lot in the networks with many people, including Opera Opera, we, the 15th of February of this year, we have presented the results of the, of the, 
on the first phase, and we had exchanges about this, and also I remember um, a, a, a session uh, about the future project next stage, uh, in which we were talking about sustainability, and I had the pleasure to moderate a radio session on, 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 on finding solutions. So the ideas are here, but what we have experimented here with, with this uh, um, design thinking method and uh, net, um, workshops in presence at the end in Saint Etienne is that it, it really works. And I, I, I remember uh, I remember a request of Tapio Sekinen. Uh, maybe you know Tapio Sekinen, he's the head of uh, workshops in, in, in Finnish opera and ballet. He's, so it's fantastic. They, they, they really have big initiatives here. He's very engaged. And uh, yeah, we, we were working in some groups. We, we were supposed to work in some groups in Saint Etienne to, to design scenarios and things like that. And at some point before we, 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 we created the third groups, the working groups, Tapia came to me and said, could we be all the technicians together so we can exchange our ideas about how to do And it was not about that, and that's not what we, we did. And in the end he was very happy, and his subgroup uh, has produced a very interesting things proposal. So, in a word I would say that the, 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 the red line of, um, of Oscar by the way, Oscar is, means, is a project for opera, scenery, security, and resource efficiency. Um, the red line of, of Oscar from the, from the very beginning to, to the end is the, is the mixity of the profiles and the skills and the sensitivities. And uh, we, we could have decided to have a few operas just to think about it and then to, 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 to ask experts to uh, to, to provide the services and to pay for the, 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 for the services. Whereas we, we have decided that we should include in the consortium of the project these experts so that we really uh, design something that is really innovative for the sector as far as sustainability is concerned on the topic of the year process. So uh, I think we, we, we made the right choice and that's what we did also in this uh, design thinking project, but I must also say that doing this, choosing this method, also made the, the, the project more, com more complex because we had to, to learn to, to know each other, uh, we, we had to speak in English, and uh, as sometimes probably the, the, the quality of the exchanges that would have been higher if we had any uh, uh, people talking with their own languages. Like, a French group or so, someone, but that's that's part of it, and um, and it's um, yeah, it's, it's it's not so easy to 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 design something, to implement something that should, that is really consistent uh, with such a diversity of profiles. But definitely, at, at the end of this project, I I, I do think it's, it's an absolute necessity. Uh, now that we are coming to the end, um, obviously, if I, if I had to, uh, to think about Oscar now, I would do it totally differently, of course. Um, but we, we have achieved, we have achieved some interesting, uh, I would say, uh, do you say, resultat d'état, or stepping results, or um, whatever, intermediate results. And my, my deepest wish now is that uh, because of Oscar is ending, that we, these results can be really shared and disseminate, disseminated so that people who would take over uh, don't start from scratch again and that uh, they, they can see what people from the sector working to, together have proposed as possible solutions. Thank you. Thank you. point that I think is very important and actually makes a link with other conversations that we have had during this conference is that those eco-responsibility policies that we can implement, they, of course, we hope they have a lot of very positive outcome on the environment, but they surely have one fantastic 
outcome is on the commitment of the staff because there are by nature transversal issues throughout the houses and no one can say they have all the answers or they have the magic, uh, uh, the, I don't know how you say that, the magic button. Uh, the magic button. wand. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, and so it, it requires people to talk together, people to, to take issues together and to look at them through different angles to, to try and find things. And so it's a fantastic tool for participation inside the house. Uh, and I've seen that uh, in, in the different theatres where I've worked, and most recently in Châtelet. Um, it's at the same time uh, a tool for having the staff to participate, but it's also a very important motivating tool. Because nowadays, and we've been talking about that extensively the, the, this, uh, these few days, uh, it's not only about making art for making art. The, the word relevance that uh, Vasiliki you had on, on, your, uh, on your screen is of course absolutely central now. And if we want us, the, the old generation, if I may say so, uh, to, to find reasons why we do this job and also to be attractive for new generations of uh, young people coming to the industry, we have to be relevant and we have to, to bring something different than just, just art for art. We have to, to be really an active force in the society to help change happen. So, I'm talking about participation and I would really like you to participate. So, I know it's not very easy because of the, the, uh, the disposition of the, of the house, but if I might have a little more light in the auditorium, I don't know if it's possible or not. And I would like you to share some of your experience with us. Uh, either you, you might have questions about uh, the, the intervention of our panelists, or you can have own experience in your theatres and would be really interested to, to share it with you. So I don't have more light, but it's, uh, uh, we, we can make it without light. But do, does anyone want to, to say something? to share experience. Please, go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Alastair Merlin. I have experience in building ecological housing, uh, although I'm not an architect or in the profession of construction. We find ourselves here in a brand new, brandly renovated opera house, and I wonder what ecological considerations may have played a role in its construction my second question is, are there architectural organizations that have sufficient know-how to help opera and theater in constructing ecologically sound buildings? So I think that would, that would be a question for you. Yeah, I, I think that um, in one way the most important thing we can do is to stop building for the moment. Um, we have a lot of theatres and opera houses and we need to make them fit for purpose first. You know, this this you know, beautifully restored building, and I, I, don't, I wasn't involved with it, so I don't know what ecological, um, to what extent technology was part of, of the design, but yes, it is possible to take existing buildings and make them more sustainable. The, the second volume of the Theatre Green Book, Sustainable Buildings, is exactly about that. And I can tell you now, you know, very, very simply, the way to go about it is first to make sure that your walls, your, your rooms, your windows, your doors are more efficient. Secondly, to make sure that your heating, your cooling, your plumbing, your services systems are more efficient, efficient. And then thirdly, to start looking at whether you can use photovoltaics or wind turbines, depending on which part of, of Europe you're in, to generate electricity. That's, that's the last thing to do. So yes, there is, there is methodology and guidance about that. With regard to new buildings, um, there's also some guidance, but as I say, the real focus is let's look at the buildings we've got, the fantastic theatres and opera houses that we've got all over Europe, and work out how we can make them fit for purpose in the context of the climate crisis. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, 
Excuse me, could I j just have a follow-up on this? Yes. Yes, uh, in England, I think you're from England, we have Opera Holland Park that has an open-air but shielded uh, theatre. Thank you. Is it on? Yes. So, in England, uh, in London, we have a, a company called Opera Holland Park, and named after the section of the uh, borough of London. Of London. Um, where their uh, theatre is actually open air, but shielded against even very torrential rains. <sighs> Be there once. Um, they obviously have uh, a very easy way of dealing with environmental concerns in a very different way. And I was wondering whether closed opera houses like this one have uh, perhaps learned from them. Uh, I think among the measures that you can take in existing buildings, uh, the uh, situation is rather more limited in building new buildings is uh, very much easier to adopt good ecological practices. It, it, it's a lot easier to, but the trouble is that any new building will contain so much what's called embodied energy. In other words, the energy that goes into concrete, that goes into steel, that goes into bricks. Um, that even if it operates more efficiently, and, and they usually will, than an older building like this, or like the Teatro Sociale at the top of the hill, um, even so, it's usually better to improve an old building than to uh, build a new building. That's, that's not a, a rule or a law. There will be places that don't have opera houses or that don't have theatres where you can justify it and then you will need to set about building in the most sustainable way you can. But, but the biggest challenge in Europe, I think, is, is trying to take our existing buildings uh, and improve them uh, as much as we can. And I think uh, Hollow Park Opera, I, I know very well, I grew up very near the area in London. Um, and I think I'm going to make a sort of general answer to that specific point, which is that when you look at the whole of theatre and opera, across Europe, or even within one country, and, and we did this in putting the Theatre Green Group together. Um, what's wonderful is the diversity. There's large scale, there's small scale, there's, there's everything from opera to new plays, there's everything from uh, outside work to work in historic buildings. And we mustn't lose that diversity. We mustn't let this sector be closed down, be diminished, be reduced by the challenge of the climate crisis. Our challenge for all of the people in this room, is to find ways to preserve and retain that, work, that richness, uh, that creative vigour, that dynamism, and not let it be stifled by the climate crisis. Uh, and, and that's why we all need to work collectively together to find those solutions. I couldn't agree more. When you point out the question of refurbishing theatres, um, of course, the problem we can have with our own governments or cities because uh, most of the times we don't have the resources, the internal resources to, to take those works uh, on the budgets of the theatres. And I want to, to say um, uh, a little story which is uh, actually not, very, not a very nice story, but um, uh, the Théâtre du Châtelet was under works for two and a half years in between 2017 and 2019, uh, carried on by and paid for by the city of Paris, who is the owner of the theater. And the city of Paris has, on many, on many issues, uh, a very dynamic ecological policy. But for the Théâtre du Châtelet, they totally ignored walls, windows, roof, energy. That was completely out of the panel. Uh, and when I asked them, but how on earth can you have imagined to do uh, uh, almost a three years project refurbishing the theatre and you did not consider at all ecological issues, they said, well, it was not in the programme and we have not forecast our budget for that, so we didn't do it. So there's, if you know there's going to be a project for refurbishing your theatre in the next few years, really begin the conversation very early with the government to say this is compulsory now and you must do it and of course there are security issues, there are technical issues which were at the heart of the refurbishing of the Chaclet. 
but they should not hide the ecological issues that we have in the buildings.
yes, it will be sacrifices because money is always limited, but they need to be based on decisions that you've shared and agreed at the earliest stages. So it, it, it's not easy. We are suddenly having to spend money on something that we didn't think we'd have to spend money on. Um, but it's, that's where we are. That's where we are in this, the state of this emergency. And when an emergency happens, then you have to change your priorities quickly and you have to face up to reality very fast. And, and I'm, I'm sure that in your project you're pushing to do that. Theatre in London, and I think I've just reflected in answer to that question that actually our experience of refurbishment in 2010 to 14, we had a major refurbishment of building, say, built in the 70s, but that, that concrete single glazing, all the other things that we had, uh, there was a big focus even then on environmental sustainability, but actually the cost of operating the building also dropped dramatically. Uh, so it's certainly thinking and taking a longer view about the operating cost, not just the capital cost, that was a very significant help. And I think as we will think about business models, and it is of course just not just a short-term view, it's a long-term view, that's really helpful. But there was also something else, and I've been struck about conversations about leadership that we've all had here over the last uh, couple of days, um, is that it's an opportunity for leadership Sustainability is a fantastic one because it really means that people across an organisation can think about how they're going to play their own part uh, in what, what they can be doing. And it really struck me that when we did the building envelope stuff, it felt as if it was the engineers and the facilities department whose responsibility it was. And actually, more recently, as we've thought about uh, the building operation, the catering, yes, that was the catering people who had their chance. Now, with the productions, it's much more meaningful. And as we all come back after COVID, the fact that everybody, the makers, can come together and see what they can do next uh, has been absolutely fantastic. And there is that reality that actually spending less on materials is also financial saving. Uh, in London, at the National Theatre, because we've got much less money than we used to have, we've said to, to ourselves, it's people, not stuff. Meaning we're not going to compromise on rehearsal times, the number of people on stage or in the orchestra pit. But we are going to think differently about how much we spend on the physical production uh, and the opportunity to recycle and reuse. And it's really, it's very exciting. And certainly a way of people thinking differently about what they can do in their areas to rebuild after COVID. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to share a little experience uh, in, this, in the same field. We, we have a little group, um, a Belgo-French group of, of houses, which is composed of uh, La Monnaie in Brussels, Opéra de Lyon, Festival d'Aix-en-Provence, Opéra Nationale de Paris, and Théâtre du Châtelet. Uh, and we gathered because we, we co-produce works together quite regularly. And so we started to, to brainstorm about what we could do to be more efficient in co-production. Because uh, traditionally we see co-production as an opportunity to mutualize the cost of production, but not to go one step further and to say, how could we mutualize the environmental impact of our productions? And that was the base of our brainstorming. It was to say, can we do something more efficient from an ecological point of view? Uh, and we started to share the different experience that we had in the different houses uh, of things we had tried to do. Um, and out of that, we decided to uh, so that, that was a conversation with directors of, of those houses and once each of us had explained to the group what we had tried in, in the last few seasons, we decided to gather a, a large group of staff of the five houses to present them with those different projects and to ask them to analyze those projects and 
to decide which one seemed to them the most interesting to pursue together in five houses. And we came up with the idea that uh, we would work on what we call standard uh, structures. The idea being that when we co-produce a work, if we can make travel less physical elements of a production uh, to go from one theatre to another, uh, it's something that is a gain. And if in the future we can build less elements for production, it's another gain from an ecological point of view. And so we are at the moment really in the, in the middle of, of a project in which we are trying to validate that project to say, is it possible for five houses to have kind of a set of mechano, if I'm simplifying it very much, uh, that we would all have in our houses. And when we co-produce a work, each one has his mechano and they can do the structure and only the decorative elements will travel from one house to the other. So there's an investment at the beginning because of course we need the first step is to be uh, to agree on what kind of mechano is efficient and what kind of mechano can we work in all those houses. But then, once the investment is done and we have uh, our elements, we will really have a, a gain. And what we hope to do, if we succeed, is progressively to, to set that as an example for other theatres with which we tend to co-produce, and that it can spread, you know, like a, like oil on on, uh, on fabric, it can spread uh, everywhere. And uh, that really made me think uh, about that because it's all about uh, how you think of what is building a production and what you can imagine, what new ideas you can have to save energy, to save transport, to save material in the way you build productions. And I think it's a very important way to think about co-productions nowadays. Are there other questions or experience sharing in the room? Yes, please. And, and, and then I see Nicholas uh, who's waiting to, to, to come on stage and I think that will be our last intervention. Yes, thank you. I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, I'm here as a journalist, but I'm also here as a music director of a little piano festival in Alba. And this September, we just organized quite a nice conference about music, classical music, and environment, which was this article conversation, which also shows how far back we are actually on in Italy on this topic. And luckily, the conference proceedings are going to be published, and this will help us spread a little bit what was staged and even during the, the conference. But actually, uh, I'm so happy, and it's really kind of awesome, an elixir for my soul to see that we are all so much on the very same page here about how um, sustainability and eco responsibility is a priority for classical music. And the conference was not only about opera house, it was more also about chamber music, festivals, and orchestras. And what we noticed with some of our guests is that in their own, also big international festivals or orchestras, the dream project was more the effort of one, two really convinced people that were trying to lead the way in this direction, but they tend to hit a wall with some of the upper management. And so my question is, when you are not all on the same page, how do you build this awareness inside the very same institution that should be leading the way? My conviction is that the urban management who is not completely convinced and involved in eco-responsibility of the theatre will soon disappear like dinosaurs. But it's a personal conviction. I might be wrong, but if I'm, if I'm true, if I'm not wrong, I mean, in a few years it will not even be an issue. And we'll all know that it's, it's not only compulsory, it's not the word. It's, it's part of what we bring to society and it's a completely natural and normal part. And I, I do think it's still a debate in certain houses, but I mean, once again, when we talk about relevance, how can we pretend we are part of a society if we don't think about the future of this society as us being 
one of the multiple agents, but one of the agents of this future. If we don't build the future that we want, no one will build it for us. So let's let's build together the future that we want to have. I think that's the one view of it. Okay, let me thank first. Oh, I'm just, can I just yes, yeah, no, a on. second, just to I'll pick on one of the things that that, that Jerry said. Um, because I don't want to leave a sense of a sort of thought or false opposition between data and no data or anything. And the work that, that Thierry and his colleagues have done is absolutely essential. It's moved us forward five or ten years in understanding. Um, my point is just that we can't wait for the conclusion of that analysis before we start changing. In time, as we understand the data better, uh, we'll certainly be able to move forward more effectively. And Thierry and I and some others have started a conversation about how to look at the next generation of calculation and data gathering. If any of you as opera houses would be interested in being part of that conversation, do please speak to, to one of us, because it, it, it's really important that we produce tools that work for everybody. Um, that's all I wanted to, to throw in. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Thierry, do you want to add anything, or that's the key? Yes, with reference to this point, a small point, with reference to what was raised, um, I couldn't agree more with you to us. I mean, it's a fact that it's happening. It's not a matter of opinion or, uh, you know, decision making. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a fact, it's a reality, and it's inescapable. So, measures to be taken uh, will be taken anyway. It's, in, it's inevitability. Otherwise, it's a dangerous case, as uh, Thomas said. And may I just say that um, it's important at the same time to look out for what is happening, uh, like uh, the Green Book or uh, Oscar. Uh, although to you, it sounds scary, but your past when Eco Perform hopefully is approved, and we still have uh, you know the same issues more or less, but we built on what Oscar has done. So it's important that the synergies and the dialogue continues together with action. That's that's what we need. Thank you. And Terry, in the end, I was thinking gives me the opportunity to say yeah, to say a word that we probably partly ask uh, answered it the last question. So that uh, we, that uh, we are at a crucial moment where capacity building is probably the the, the issue of the one. Because as long as we actually don't understand what we are talking about, we can't, we can't design and implement relevant action and efficient action. And so we all need capacity building from top management to secretary, including uh, workshops and everybody and marketing people, etc. So, and as we said, and as Vasiliki said at the beginning, we are in a round table about ecology, eco responsibility, but Sustainability is much broader, and so we, we, we really need, depending on, on because how, how what we do is transforming itself, whatever we think, whatever we want. So, really, training and capacity building is at the core of it, and that will probably help you to to really also convince people that, that, that they, they, they have no choice in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Next performance is coming, so really, we really have to give the stage to Nicholas and um, well thank you to to be audience thank you.